the roundtable discussion, Unlocking the Mysteries of the Cell. I'm Stephanie Audi from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and it's my honor to, uh, uh, to uh, moderate this discussion. Uh, the session brings together an esteemed panel of experts in physics, biology, and bioimaging to discuss how scientific collaboration and technology can advance our understanding of human biology. Before we dive in, I'd like to introduce the panelists. Uh, first, Sarah Teichman is um, co-founder and co-leader of the International Human Cell Atlas Consortium, uh, which uses single-cell genomics and spatial methodologies to create comprehensive, high-resolution maps of the human body. Additionally, she is head of cellular genetics at the Welcome Sanger Institute. Steve Quake is head of science at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, where he oversees CZI's grant programs, technology development efforts, and scientific institutes. Steve is also professor of bioengineering and applied physics at Stanford. And Lucy Collinson is a microbiologist and electron microscopist um, at the Francis Crick Institute. And she runs a range of projects and uses imaging to image from proteins to whole organisms. We're excited to invite this group here today uh, to discuss their research and to also talk about its implications for understanding cellular function and dysfunction. And we'd also like to talk about how the scientific fields can come together and collaborate to make rapid progress in our understanding of the mysteries of the cell. And so I'd like to set the context here and start the first question with Steve. What do we mean by understanding the mysteries of the cell? And what sort of transformation can this have for, for biomedicine? So understanding the mysteries of the cell, the cell is the smallest indivisible unit of life. Um, Scientists have studied it for hundreds of years, and it's an ama they're amazing little machines. Um, they replicate, they divide, they can you know, uh, uh, create daughter cells, images of themselves uh, in ways that we understand parts of, but many aspects of that still a mystery. Um, if we were sort of embarking on the, this program 20 or 30 years ago, it would probably be understanding the mysteries of the biological macromolecule. Um, and over that period of time, I'd say that's in many ways been solved. Genomes sequenced, check the box. Uh, protein structures solved or predicted. Um, and our knowledge of the individual constituents of the cell is just increased enormously. But we really don't understand how they work together in the cell to help the cells do the things they do. Um, and if you look at sort of what happened 20 years ago, which was the beginning of the genomics revolution, that just absolutely revolutionized the field of genetics. And the field has been transformed. Um, and we're on the brink of a similar sort of revolution in cell biology, I believe. And it's not just of any single technology, but multiple things coming together at the same time, which I think we're going to talk about today. But, you know, in sum, it's the application of genomic approaches to look at phenotype instead of genotype. It's the development of new forms of microscopy. It's the application of computation at a scale that wasn't possible before. And all that is just really changing the way uh, we're understanding cells, and we're poised to make it's going to be a great decade for the field. Maybe I'll pause there. Very good. And then Lucy, um, advances in bioimaging have provided unprecedented views of biology and action. But access to the technology um, is limited, and it limits the discoveries that researchers can make. Um, can you tell us more about how you're thinking about addressing this problem? Yeah. Um, so going away back. I started off in a very traditional career path in science. Um, so I did a degree and a PhD in microbiology and cell biology. And then for my postdoc, I started using light and electron microscopes. And it was then that I realized that I love the technology actually more than any specific biological question. And so about 20 years ago, I moved into running electron microscopy core facilities. Um, and now I'm working at the Francis Crick Institute in London, so we're the biggest biomedical research institute under one roof in Europe. We have more than 100 research groups, and they work on all sorts of topics, uh, neuroscience, cancer, aging, infectious diseases. 
And we also have now 17 core facilities where we centralize the people and the equipment that you need to really drive discovery and clinical research. So we have omics techniques like genomics, proteomics, uh, metabolomics, and we have a lot of imaging. And then some newer facilities like the making facility that will create anything from a CAD drawing that you need for your research. Um, and we applied my technique, electron microscopy, to a range of different research questions. But my field has jumped forward hugely in the last 30 years. So back in the 1980s, Sydney Brenner's team in Cambridge did a piece of work that was called the mind of the worm using electron microscopy. And the worm is about one millimeter long and only 100 microns wide. And they wanted to map all of the neural connections in the worm. And to do that, you need to be able to see single synapses that are communicating with each other, but across the long distances that nerves travel. Um, and you need electron microscopes, but they normally only image very thin slices of material. So to image the mind of the worm, the team cut the worm into 10,000 individual sections and imaged them one by one. And if you lose any of those sections, you have to start again. So it took them 10 years, and all of the analysis was done manually. And now we skip 30 years later, and we're now in the era of the mind of the fly. So we've gone up to millimeter scale. Um, and that's just been mapped in the last couple of years. But this kind of technology is difficult to run. It needs experts. It's expensive. And we actually spent six years designing the rooms at the Crick just to be able to hold the microscopes and know they would run properly. Um, so it tends to be stuck in just a few uh, well-funded institutes. And with funding from CZI, now we're taking almost the opposite approach. So we're taking our decades of experience in imaging and we're using it to try and make every step of the pipeline simpler. So we're making new protocols that you don't need expensive equipment for and you don't need toxic chemicals. We're using miniaturized microscopes which can be run on the bench top and I could train you to use them in half an hour and touch screens. Um, and then we are working with uh, computational scientists to help design open source software to layer on top of the microscopes for automated acquisition. And then we're going to be generating terabytes of image data. So with that, we have scientists also helping us to work out how we handle it, especially offer a central site um, and put it into the hands of uh, research scientists. So the idea is then that this could be used anywhere in the world. Uh, you don't need an, uh, an expert electron microscopist because there aren't that many of us. And we'll, we have collaborators in South Africa in Stellenbosch who are the only experts in what we call correlative and multimodal imaging. So this is now actually cross-scale because the samples are so big. Um, the systems will be shipped to them so that we can't just turn up in the room and help them to get it up and running. They have expertise um, and they'll be settling them off-site in a, a lower resource area. And then, once it's working, they'll be rolling it out to all sorts of science on the African continent. And to prove that it works, we're applying it to Parkinson's disease um, and to brain cancer and to uh, kidney transplant rejection to see if we can see new signatures of disease at the nanoscale, which we hope eventually would even run through to diagnostics. Um, maybe one last um, comment. So we're also not just trying to roll out our science to scientists, but also to the general public. So for the last six years or so, we've been working with the Zooniverse Citizen Science Platform, which was set up to help Chris Lintot in Oxford to feed out his millions of images of galaxies to the general public so they could help him classify the galaxies and get past the problem with um, limited people to do manual annotation. So we're doing the same thing with our images of cells. Our first paper, um, the citizen scientists help us to work out how to segment, so draw around the nucleus of cells in every single image to make 3D models which we can quantify. And we now have a whole suite of uh, citizen science projects coming up to the newest one. So if you search for immuno explorers, you can help us to research into kidney transplant rejection. The project is called Etch-a-Cell. 
and you could be one of our co-authors on the paper. So our, our first citizen science paper had 5,000 authors on it. Um, and you can go through from the author list and see the scrolling list of names. Sarah, for those that aren't familiar, uh, what is the Human Cell Atlas and what progress has this group made so far? Sure, so the Human Cell Atlas is a project to um, create the molecular map of the cells and tissues in the human body. And um, the reason that we need that is that we don't actually know the cells inside our own organs at this point in time. So if you look on Wikipedia, you'll see about 200 cell types that are listed there. Um, recent uh, papers mapping the tissues in the human brain, which has hundreds of different tissues within one organ, estimate on the order of thousands of cell types. And the, that mapping uh, project is, was made possible by the resolution revolution in genomics. So as Steve mentioned, there's been basically a, a revolution in genomics where we're able, so, so about a dozen years ago, it became clear that we'd be able to sequence the nucleic acid content of individual cells. And so that was really a game changer because it allows us to identify the molecular fingerprint of different cell types and cell states within a heterogeneous tissue sample like a biopsy, for instance, that, that Lucy mentioned for diseases. But of course, we also want to know the cell states in the, the healthy state in the human body. Um, and the combination of single cell genomics, spatial genomics technologies, which can be sequencing or imaging driven, coupled with data science technologies, AI, ML, and so on, are allowing us to create that Google street map of the cells in our body and the tissues in our body. And um, the, the origin of the project uh, as an international consortium goes back uh, uh, about eight years or so now um, when I took on this, the job as head of cellular genetics at the Sanger Institute and reached out to Aviv Regev, who was at the Broad Institute in Boston at that time. And um, we decided together to call, to, to call out to the international community um, to get together and tackle this project together because it's really much bigger than anything that an individual scientist, an individual research group, an individual institute can do, but this is something that the global community needs to work on together to make the data open and to run the project as an open science project that anyone can join. And, and we were totally on the same page on that front, and anyone can, can sign up. It's an interdisciplinary, highly interdisciplinary effort, obviously, with, um, uh, you know, I've mentioned data scientists, genomics technology, imaging, clinician specialists, biomedical specialists in different tissues. And you can sign up at www.humancellatlas.org slash join hyphen HCA and just sign up to the, the ethical uh, and, and equity principles, our values of, of global openness, which are absolutely key to our community, and, and join. And I should say that the, the project was, of course, made possible by funders like the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Welcome, the European Commission, the NIH, the National Institute of Health of the USA, um, the, the Helmsley Charitable Trust, the Klarman Family Foundation, the UK Medical Research Council, national funders in Sweden, France, Germany, and so on, philanthropic funders also in other countries, including Sweden. And, and it's really such a large, global, diverse initiative that it's those global consortium of funders that have made it possible, and we're very fortunate in that sense. So you asked about our progress. So, so far, we've mapped on the order of 100 million cells from all the major tissues, not, not comprehensive, but the major tissues in the body, and, and mostly using, that's mostly using suspension cell technologies telling us about individual cells, and, and we're now making progress also on tissue sections telling us about where the tissues sit in 2D, and then obviously in consecutive sections, reconstructing 3D like Lucy was describing. And this is, this is, these detailed results are described in almost 200 publications that are available on the website. And, and obviously mapping the healthy tissues in, is, a, is an enormous task. Um, it's already given us insights into the, also the, 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 the you know, comparing the healthy reference state to the disease state. And um, in, in, in cancers, in, in auto-inflammatory diseases, in lung and cardiovascular disease, and I want to just pick the example of COVID-19 to illustrate why 
actually understanding our healthy reference tissues can be um, extremely useful per se, uh, as it were. And that is when the pandemic, early in the pandemic hit, we got together as a community, and, and this was driven by the, the lung biological network, which is the, the sub-community of researchers was actually formed through the pan driven by the pandemic, which was viewed as a respiratory kind of disease uh, at, at that time. And we pooled all of our data in a very rapid way and put together a sort of very rough initial draft of all the data that we had from all the tissues in the body you know, that we had at that time. And what it revealed to us was that the viral entry factors were expressed in specific cells in the, the eyes, in the, in the corneal epithelium, the lining of the nose, the, the nasal epithelium, and later also in the salivary glands in the oral cavity. And that information itself was very valuable for informing um, public policy around transmission, preventing transmission, mask wearing, et cetera. So understanding that molecular detail of those tissues was very valuable in that sense, and then also the transmission kind of internally, and also verti uh, uh, vertically, basically, at the, the, the decidual placenta interface between mother and, and fetus. So, so all of that healthy reference information was actually useful at that time and tells you that the human cell atlas is a molecular guidebook for the human body. So it tells us about where viral entry factors or other pathogen entry factors are expressed, and that information is useful for understanding those early phases of infection. It's also useful for looking up where genetic variants may penetrate in, in development and adult tissues. Um, so it also serves as a guidebook for genetic variants. And also recently, we, sh we illustrated in the cardiac conduction system that it's useful as a guidebook, as a molecular guidebook, for showing where drug targets are expressed. And so there, um, we map the, the, the this, is, this is work from us with collaborators, we map the sinoatrial node of the heart and showed the molecular fingerprint of the human pacemaker cells for the first time. And, and that illustrated where chronotropic drugs that increase or decrease heart rate are acting, but also where uh, drugs that are not uh, metabolic, for instance, like liraglutide and semaglutide, may be impacting heart rate on, in, in an unintentional mechanism through action on, on uh, because we found that the GLP-1 receptor is expressed in pacemaker cells. So there are these utility, basically, for understanding mechanism of drug action, side effects, and so on. I want to finish by also pointing out that having that molecular fingerprint of our cells serves as a a blueprint for cell therapies, tissue engineering, and so on. So knowing our healthy reference cells can progress also tissue engineering, cell engineering, and in vitro systems, and is, is, is useful in that sense to understand our bodies at that level of detail. And, and just to say that we're now kind of eight years into, or you know, since we had our initial kickoff meeting, which Steve was at, there were about 100 people there, in 2016, and we're now in the first phase of assembling our data and creating reference data sets, which we've done for the lung and for the brain, and we're now doing for 18 other tissues, also with support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and we hope that by 2025, we'll be able to release those reference data sets uh, for the community. So it's an incredibly exciting time. It's only the start. Looking forward, we hope that we'll have on the order of a billion cells sequenced over the next five to 10 years, and also comprehensive spatial mapping of our tissues, understanding how the cells work together at the molecular level in tissues. And, um, and, and we, are, we wanna create a, a human cell atlas that's globally representative in terms of uh, uh, also the donors. We have about 10,000 individual donors, uh, sort of patient and, and donor samples now. It, we want the human cells to be, to be representing the community to be open and to, to really have a, a transformational impact in the long term on healthcare and democratize it in a global sense. So that's really the, the progress so far. Thank you, Stephanie. Steve, as the field of cell biology is rapidly evolving and producing these vast quantities of data, how are you thinking about dressing the data bottlenecks and ultimately driving insight into cellular function? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Lucy had mentioned Sidney Brenner, and you know, he was such an intellectual giant and incredibly witty person. I think we could all talk about how he's influenced our science. I mean, certainly he anticipated Absolutely. the Cell Atlas. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, for me, just as a detour, deciding to 
take the job as head of science, you know, also a little bit inspired. He was once asked, of all the omics, genomics, metabolomics, proteomics, which is the most important? He said, economics. <laughs> <laughs> so Cesar, I have a chance to influence the economics a little bit. Um, but he also, uh, I think, very rightly said, biology is drowning in a sea of data and starving for knowledge. Um, and that is really, I think, a fundamental challenge for the field in that we're great at churning out huge amounts of data, whether it's sequence data, image data, um, but deriving insight from it is, um, is challenging. Um, you know, I think we're making progress. Um, part of this is that when you make one of these data sets, you're putting it out there for the whole scientific community to use. Um, any paper you write about it just gets into a little bit of it. And other people will use it for things you never anticipated. Um, and uh, that's part of how you deal with it, I think, is just putting it out there for the whole community to access. Um, another part, I think, is going to be, I mentioned earlier, advances in computing. We're in a revolution right now around artificial intelligence, large language models. That's going to distill some of the, I think, sort of uh, fundamental, math, fundamental mathematical essence underlying some of these large data sets. And that's going to change the way we look at these data sets a lot. I mean, uh, the protein models are, are really amazing. And it's just a matter of time before we get similar sorts of models for understanding cells and that sort of data. Um, looking at what we're doing at the Imaging Institute at CZI, um, which we were just talking about, just moved into their space last week, um, it's clear that they're not going to be able to achieve their goals without there being major advances in computational techniques. And it's going to, I mean, really for cryo-electron tomography of cells, the long pole in the tent is the computation. Um, so the challenge is out there. And over the next few years, I think we'll see a, a lot of progress in how to address it. And so each of your projects across cell science, across uh, bioimaging and technology, um, requires collaboration on an international level. And I'd like to hear your thoughts about how to facilitate um, these types of collaborations. We'll start with you, Lucy. It's a very good question. Um, I think looking at the collaborations we have, so the, the Chan Zuckerberg initiative funded project I talked about we have collaborators in London but also over in Portugal and some human tissue projects we're working with we're working with Hamburg Heidelberg um, and Cambridge and all of those people I've known for a long time so I think the seeds of collaboration come from those serendipitous meetings that you have with people at conferences or at talks or so Getting out and about again is really important and meeting new people and just being interested in stuff that's outside of your comfort zone. So we have physicists, chemists, computational scientists um, in our collaboration groups and they're allowing us to do things that we, we can't do just as biologists and microscopists. I think you have to identify amongst the people you meet who is filling a gap for the work that you need to do. And then you need some kind of seed funding that allows you to do the first experiments with those people to show that what you want to do is feasible before you start to scale up. I think generally the, the most important thing is communication and learning to speak other people's languages. So I'm very fortunate. I have a physicist slash computational scientist in my team who over the years has taught me how to speak physics and how to speak coding and how to speak AI just enough, because I'm never going to be a specialist in those fields, but just enough that I can translate um, what I need to do and what they need to do into an overarching vision for the project that will then underpin discovery research and clinical research for the scientists at the Crick. And the broader your collaboration space, the more languages you have to learn. And it's difficult, but and it's, I think they say that children, when they're learning multiple languages when they're young, take le longer to speak. But when they do, they speak multiple languages. It, as scientists, it takes longer, I think, to learn to speak all of those languages. But when you come out of that learning zone, then it's extremely powerful, and you can start to tie together big multidisciplinary teams from both of you as well on this topic, Sarah. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so the global collaboration was really important to both Aviv and me in the Human Cell Atlas from the get-go. So we wanted, you know, and, and, and there was a kind of a tendency maybe at the beginning to say, okay, should we divide up the body? Like the, you know, the journalists asked me like, do you, are you dividing up the body like by country? And, you know, so one country takes, I don't know, the heart, another one takes the brain. But we, neither of us really wanted that. We wanted people to work together across countries who are, like you're saying, are specialists and, and interested and passionate about that tissue and that topic and, and to get the, 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 the best science done, right? So I'm one of those kids you know, who grew up with two languages. My father's German, my mother's American. I don't know whether it took me longer to speak those languages or not, but basically you know, the, 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 the science is global and, um, and interdisciplinary, and to get the best result, maybe you do have to take longer. I, I like that analogy. I think it's, 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 it's fantastic, Lucy, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I guess the challenge then is how to, how to organize the community. Um, and, and the way we organize that in Human Cell Atlas is by technology. So we have the analysis, computational data science working group, standards and technologies, and then we have individual organ and tissue networks and systems, so lung, heart, brain, et cetera. Um, and, but, but each of those is completely global in terms of scientists, right? And the economics comes into it. How do you get funding to fund science that's done by scientists in different countries? Not so easy, not so obvious, because a lot of funders are national funders, right? And so there are some funders, CZI is one of them, you know, the philanthropies are more free sometimes than the government organizations um, that are able to fund scientists working together across many countries. And I, I want to kind of reiterate my gratitude to all the funders who've made that possible, which is really, uh, you know, really the economics is important. What we wanted also was to really increase our global reach across the whole world and include scientists from Africa, Latin America, and, and a right across Asia. Now, that was a challenge for us but the, uh, the challenge that we tackled right from the beginning by inviting them to our meetings, by nucleating uh, scientists in centers in, in all the different continents, and then building out uh, so-called regional networks. So in addition to the scientific topics, we also have regional networks. So, you know, Africa, Human Cell Atlas, Africa Regional Network, Human Cell Atlas, Latin America. And, and, you know, we're very grateful that we've been able to have funding and meetings for f in those places. We've been able to have training workshops in those places, which have be gone down really well. And then also funding that's included scientists from those areas to also study samples from donors and patients from all across the globe so that the Human Cell Atlas is representative of, of many, many tens of thousands of people right across the world. So that was, that was very important. And I, and I also want to emphasize that we are a grassroots driven community. So we are, the Human Cell Atlas is organized by scientists. It's, it's, it started off as like volunteer work basically. Um, now we have about uh, uh, 10 or so uh, scientists or, or, or support staff who are kind of the backbone of the organization and support and enable the consortium. And, and they're located also in, uh, across, distributed across the world um, uh, in, 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 in Boston, in, in Cambridge, UK, in Asia, in, in Japan, in China, in Hong Kong, uh, and Singapore, and um, the working together, having that staff, those 10 or 12 staff members funded by CZI Welcome, the Klarman Family Foundation, and hopefully more, that is actually key because they, they also enable us to, uh, to do the communication that's so important that Lucy mentioned. So I think it is a challenge, you know, uh, at many levels, at a communication, funding, structure, inclusion, and so on. But it's very, very worthwhile and very gratifying and gives the best result in terms of our science and, 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 and the insights that we can gain. Yeah. So <coughs> it's, at CZI, um, collaboration is the heart of pretty much everything we do. And it sort of permeates the philosophy of the organization. Um, <coughs> I got my start with uh, Mark and Priscilla's philanthropy as the founding co-president of their first institute, the San Francisco Biohub. And that, the motivation was to bring together the three great universities of the Bay Area, Stanford, UCSF, and Berkeley, to take on big projects that they wouldn't otherwise do. And the three universities had never worked together before, um, ever. <laughs> 
So we managed to do that um, and establish many collaborations across the universities and built community there. Um, on the grander scale, our tabula projects, making whole organism cell atlases of mouse, fly, human, lemur. Those were involving dozen research groups across the universities. The papers had like 150 authors on them, so really team science. Um, we also nucleated smaller person-to-person -person collaborations, um, one that just published in Nature last week. If you saw the paper on starfish symmetry breaking and development, how that all happens, that was Dan Roxar and Chris Lowe. Um, that was a Berkeley-Stanford collaboration. Um, and it took sort of years to germinate, but it really was a beautiful thing in the end, and just great to see that kind of come to fruition. We've now um, decided to try to capture lightning in a bottle again and see if we can replicate the biohub model. So this year we've launched two new biohubs, one in Chicago, one in New York, with the same kind of idea of bringing together great universities who are geographically close to take on big problems. So in Chicago, um, we brought together University of Chicago, Northwestern, and University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, um, around problems of instrumenting tissues um, and studying inflammation that way. Uh, so we're very excited over that, to see what that's gonna bring. In New York, which was just announced last month, it's Rockefeller, Columbia, and Yale, uh, taking on problems of engineering a cellular endoscope, explore the body. Um, also, very excited to see that get off the ground. Um, so we'll see where that goes. In our grant giving, um, we work very hard to get the, uh, the grantees to work together. Stephanie is one of our program officers, one of six program officers, and. Um, they uh, uh, are really um, trying to make sure that, you know, it's not just writing a check to folks and walking away, but bringing all the grantees together in a given area in meetings regularly, having them share their results ahead of publication and have the, um, the whole be greater than the sum of the parts. Um, <clears throat> some of the grants themselves uh, are structured explicitly as collaborative grants. Collaborative pairs is one mechanism that's been used very successfully. Um, where you try to get people from different disciplines, often technology and biology, working together and try to bring them together on a person-to-person -person basis. And I think that's just been terrific. Um, I'm excited about that. Um, yeah, so collaboration is sort of at the heart of it all. We really believe it's uh, crucial for driving scientific discovery. All right, and we would like to open up uh, uh, time for questions from the audience. Um, if you raise your hand, I think somebody will come around and, and give you a microphone. I have a question to Sarah. Um, so it appears to me that now this atlas is uh, uh, geographically uh, spread. Um, are you also planning or already preparing an atlas that goes from like embryo to old age. Yeah, 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 no, so, so human development, so, you know, first, second trimester pregnancy and so on is very much already actively kind of uh, uh, data in data generation and we have a human developmental cell atlas uh, um, bio network that's focusing on that, and they we published our roadmap on that in Nature last year, I think, or maybe the year before. Um, and you know, postnatal sort of, you know, postnatal stages and adult is is so the pediatric cell atlas, um, you know, from birth to to through 16, age 16, and so on, is also part of the effort, and and that's also had a. Um, a round of awards for, that Steve can talk about, maybe from, from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Yeah, yep. I hope that answers the question. Hi, thanks so much for a great discussion. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the kinds of pressing questions scientists are trying to answer about cell biology at the moment. Okay. <laughs> maybe I'll take a first swag at it. Um, you know, one of the really fundamental ones for me, you know, pretty much every cell in your body has got the same genome in it, but nobody can predict those cell types from the genome. That's an open question. How do you do that? Um, and uh, in a certain sense, these ATLAS efforts are an attempt to address that experimentally by creating these molecular definitions and inventories, um, and hope maybe that will lead us to uh, a more principled, fundamental approach to do that, but, you know. How do you know what the cell types are going to be from the genome? That, yeah, for me, pretty fundamental. I don't know what your favorites are. Yeah, I guess, you know, so the question that I pose is what are the cells in our body in a molecular sense? We don't know. I mean, it's in, that's flabbergasting in this day and age, right? 
you know, the placenta, I mentioned the placenta decidua, so I talked to a midwife just now who's here before. Like, we didn't really understand how the uterus, you know, the cells in the uterus change during pregnancy, like when the placenta, you know, when the fetus implants and the placenta forms. I mean, these are key questions for human health, uh, you know, that are going to have massive impacts for healthcare. Um, so I would say it's what are the cells, how do they interact, and, you know, how do they change? What Steve, I think, is tr kind of trying to allude to also is how are they regulated, how, are, how, are the, how is cell state controlled, and therefore, you know, how does it change in the developmental stages? How does it change in disease? You know, can we... Uh, also get at a, a functional understanding, maybe through this molecular and structural understanding. Uh, I have a question here. Thanks Actually, for the discussion. Before we do that, I think we should let the other two share their frontier ideas, because we all, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got one for Imaging Institute, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, for me, it's always hard to choose because we work on around 100 research projects a year in collaboration with the scientists at the Crick, so we can pretty much pick anything from any area of biology, and I don't like to have favorites. One of the joys is sitting down with the expert in every single area and then taking an hour to tell us what the most important thing is in that area that they're researching. But <laughs> um, it's always amazing working with people who have imaging experience because they frequently want to push the boundaries of what's possible. And they give us a bit more space and a bit more time to develop the technology for them. So with Max Gutierrez at the Crick, he works on mycobacterium tuberculosis. And with electron microscopes, we're looking into the cell. We can see individual membranes. And that means we can also see uh, pathogens inside the cell hiding from uh, the cellular responses and from the host immune responses. And with Max, something that we've done is to look at targeting where those bacteria are using fluorescent markers and light microscopes, and then zooming in and imaging them with the electron microscopes, and then even going to our national physical laboratory to use new types of microscopes that image with ions so that we can see where the antibiotics are in relation to the bacteria. And that kind of information then helps people to target antibiotics better against pathogens. And you can use the same kind of pathways to look at cancer as well. So we have a lot of work with uh, researchers who are looking at how individual cells break away from primary tumors, how they cross across blood vessels, and then travel around the body to form secondary tumors, which then give a poorer prognosis for the patients. So really pulling out the nanoscale hallmarks of those processes so that hopefully we can, from a research side, uh, design drugs against them, but also then from a diagnostic point of view, recognize the features and hopefully uh, detect earlier or predict disease processes. Yeah. and. Ultimately, so I run the, the imaging program at, at CCI, and ultimately what we want to be able to do is really visualize any biological process across spatial scales um, within, within the body. And so I think when we're talking about um, cells, we're looking at both the protein interactions within the, the cellular environment, going all the way up to understanding cellular function within the whole human body. Um, and I think it's important to, to look at these processes in a dynamic way, uh, to be able to study them in an individual way. We want to be able to look inside of your body and understand what's happening at the cellular level up to the whole organism level, to be, to be able to understand how disease is manifesting in your system. And so I think for us, it's important for the development of new technologies to be able to give us those comprehensive views. Yeah, we've just launched a new imaging institute, which is aimed at using cryotentomography to image proteins and structures within cells with atomic resolution. There's, even though the constituent parts are known, as you were talking about earlier, how they assemble into structures within the cell, um, many interesting open questions around that, how these superstructures created, um, how is what happens in vivo different than what you see in vitro. Um, coming back to the cell atlases, the questions of evolutionary relationships between cell types. We know how to measure evolutionary distance between genes. We don't really know how to do that between cell types. And 
many interesting questions about that. What's the origin of multicellularity? I mean, they all kind of tie into that. The list goes just on and on and on. <laughs> I have a question here. So uh, thanks for a great discussion. So we know it starts very complex. So we discussed the new measure, the new tools to help us to understand the uh, cells better. So my question is uh, to your, uh, maybe to your estimation, how much we already know uh, for cells and uh, in terms of percentage and how much uh, we still need to, uh, to uh, try to understand the full uh, feature, full functionality of cells to each of uh, these uh, panel members. Give me an estimation, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question. Um, I think in imaging and actually seeing the structures of the cell, I mean, it's an old discipline. It comes from kind of mid 19th century that you know, the first organelles being defined. I think we still don't even know what every organelle looks like. So as electron microscopists, some of them we can recognize by their structure. Some of them we need to add molecular signatures on top using correlative microscopy. So this protein is here and so it means it's a lysosome and it's degrading something. I think there's, in every cell type, there are gonna be new organelles that appear that surprise us at the moment if people ask us, you know, what some of the stuff is, we say, well, that's a blob. <laughs> and that's all. It's, it's something blobby. It's our best guess. We have no idea what its function is. But I think to get to those things, then we need this multi-scale, multimodal imaging that ties in, you know, what genes are being expressed, uh, what proteins are localized there, what the cell's doing. And I think that's the era we're in now, tying all of these technologies together to try and get a deeper understanding of cells. Yeah, I think it's hard to talk about it in percentages, but I would say the way you should think about the genome is that it's a parts list. Well, the parts are known in the sense that sequences of the parts, the structures are predicted or solved. So the parts are known. Which parts are used in which cell types? That's kind of the point of these Atlas projects. So that's kind of at the rough draft stage, I think, now. And so it's known for many important cell types of the body. Um, and because it's measured through RNA, um, you know, it's, it's, I think, most useful for questions that are happening on long time scales, hours and longer. Um, and things that are happening on faster time scales dynamically, the RNA is not so good at capturing. And so there's many questions about fast time scale things that I don't think there's an equivalent, you know, kind of global approach to yet. And, and those are interesting frontier problems. And so we're kind of like, we're knocking off the long time scale things, and I think the field will work its way back to faster events over time. Sorry, we're, we're uh, at time. I just want to uh, close this session with one final forward-looking thought. So imagine we're having this conversation in 10 years from now. What do you hope we will have accomplished? And I'll start with, with you. I guess in 10 years from now, you know, I'd really like to have the complete human cell atlas completed. That's not going to surprise you. Um, so that means really having, you know, the, the single cell transcriptomic, potentially also open chromatin, you know, multiomic fingerprint of all the cell types and cell states in our body and having the spatial genomics map of all the tissues in our body. That would be, I would be happy. That would make me very happy. So that's, that's what I hope. And that will then have a lot of knock-on implications. 10 years, boy, it's like Yogi Berra said, predictions are really difficult, especially when they're about the future. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I think the cell atlas will be knocked off. Um, they'll be you know, used every day by biologists asking all kinds of questions. It'll be like a work at a tool, like the way the genome is now. People are gonna refer to them to look up all kinds of things. Um, I think on the electron microscopy side, um, it'll be light years ahead of where it is now. I mean, you know, like orders of magnitude faster to do experiments, resolution will be substantially better, and you'll be really interrogating um, at a sort of molecular structural level what's going on in cells on a routine basis. Um, I think I would go in two different directions. So I would hope that these kind of democratized technologies are enabling local science in institutes and universities globally and that will allow people to image small volumes that are often enough to answer their questions. But 
At the same time, I talked about the era of the mind of the worm and the mind of the fly. In 10 years, we'll be deep into the mind of the mouse, and that takes us from millimeter scale to centimeter scale. But the, at the moment, it looks like it, with current technology, it would take hundreds of years and tens of billions of dollars to map just one mouse brain. Um, there's a beautiful paper that compares the mind of the worm to the width of one airline seat, the mind of the fly to six and a half, uh, seven, four sevens, and then the, mind of, the scale of the mind of the mouse is the distance from Boston to Lisbon. So we need advances at every stage of the imaging workflow, and most of those can't be deployed locally because they need specialists to run them and specialist places to house them. So I hope that we also have open access institutes, a new kind of uh, model for technology deployment that is accessible to anyone, anywhere who has that scale of biological question, not just for local well-funded uh, institutes. All right, and I wanna thank you all for your attendance today and thank our incredible panelists for your insights.